Guys, uh, the message is called the, the message is called the high cost for truth. Oh, yeah. The high cost for truth. That's the message today, and it is a high cost, yeah. right? And for a pastor, the high cost for truth. When you're trying to do what it is that God has called you to do, man, if uh, if I can say. Um, you know, the, what the Lord had put on my heart was career suicide. If, if there's anything that I've done as a pastor, you know, uh, <coughs> career suicide is definitely the best way to explain it from the norm, right? Because there's some things that... You know, pastors out there won't touch, but there ain't anything that I won't touch. Oh, yeah. And because of it, if you're trying to be make your pastorship a career, you can forget about it. You're just going to commit suicide because you won't be able to live, especially if you're preaching truth. Oh. Right? And you guys know it as far as, uh, you know, the high cost for truth, career suicide. But I'm going to tell you another thing about that. Career suicide for a pastor is also career suicide for a true follower of Jesus Christ. For you guys. Because when you make a stand for what's true, for truth, and, you know, you're going to find out that you ain't going to be accepted. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be called everything that, you know... You know that there is out there and if we just use our eyes to look at what the church world out there says is success you know first thing they want to ask me if I go to a pastor's meeting how many people you pastor because they judge you according to how big your flock is how successful you are but the problem is they won't touch the things that God is actually told them to touch traditions I'm not only talking about just the traditions of just paganism and, and stuff like that. I'm just talking about tradition. So um, there's all sorts of things as a pastor that I've committed career suicide with. Whether it was, you know, just a, a couple of things. Uh, traditions. You know, we have a tradition that we have church on Sunday. And if you don't have church on Sunday and Wednesday, that's career suicide for a pastor. Just change the, the, uh, the service day. I've done that. <laughs> and watch them walk out the door. Right? Man, I can't follow you. Right? Just by going from Sunday to fr Friday. So we can become a family, eat dinner together, fellowship, break bread. Hey, you know. So if you don't go to church on Sunday... Well, you go to church on Friday, you don't go to, on Sunday. I remember when being in the world, when I'm going to church on Sunday and I, I'm watching a guy go down the street pulling a boat and I'm like, man, them heathens. <laughs> yeah, right? You ain't in church on Sunday, you're heathen. You know, that's the judgment. So if you, if you go to church here on Saturday, well, you know, don't expect too many other people to accept you. Oh, they're going to label you, put you in a slot. You're probably Seventh-day Adventist. You're one of those Sabbath keepers, you know. So when God tells you to do something, you have to do it. And, you know, you just basically, you know, uh, for a pastor in the world, they would dare not do that because they mo their money walks out the door. You know, and that's what they're more concerned about, their money. The other thing, career suicide... Uh, Tell people you ain't celebrating the, the traditional holidays. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, ooh. Boy, you're in trouble. Big time. Man, you know, that's not only for a pastor. There ain't no way a pastor, the majority of the pastors of any of these big congregations that's out there will dare stand up and, you know, teach on what these pagan holidays were all about and how they infiltrated the church. And it's paganism. They won't do it. Why? Because they'll watch some more people walk out the church, right? right. Um, you know, have God tell you, you know, and show you from the word that the tithe is old covenant. Ooh, ooh, a preacher, man. 
That's career suicide for a pastor. Man, you tell a church that they don't have to pay that tithe, their old covenant. Oh, my God. It would be, you know, the flock would be happy because they wouldn't be whipped on and beat on so much. But, you know, they're going to get rid of that pastor because they can't do a building fund. They can't, you know, that's a... Try to tell someone that you don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. Oh, my God. Not only as a pastor, but you as, as, as sheep. And I'm a sheep, too. Tell people, you, you know, you believe that it's a good possibility the Lord might come at the end and we might have to go through some stuff. Man, I'll tell you, any of you, you guys know Rob Skiba and, uh, Rob Skiba and uh, Doug Hamp? Um, man, these guys in the Prophecy magazine, Doug Hamp had five pages of literature and DVDs and books and Rob Skiba had a page and all that and he went on the show one time and said, man, that it's, un it's not biblical or found that there's actually a pre-tribulational rapture. They ripped him out of the magazine. They took him out of the magazine the next day. Oh, took all his books, took his DVDs and disowned him. Right? So Doug Hamp, that is, you know, had five pages, went on a talk show with Rob Skiba, and they was discussing going over the scriptures, and when it was done, Rob Skiba asked Doug, what do you think now? He said, you know, after going over the scriptures like that, you know what, brother, I don't see it biblically how there's a pre-tribulational rapture. The Prophecy Club disowned him the next day, pulled everything. So that's career suicide. And a lot of these people won't address it. But it's also for you guys. If you tell someone that, man, it's a good possibility that, man, they'll disown you. You know? Your family will disown you. If you try to reveal and, and show them the truth that's in the scriptures. You know? Um, I mean, there's a bunch out there. <laughs> hey, talk about Nephilim and giants. <laughs> Ooh, so, man. I had them leave the church and go up to Pastor Allen. And, and tell Pastor Allen that I said that I'm preaching on, you know, the aliens are going to return and, and flying saucers and, yeah. and all kind of stuff like that. And, I mean, I got a visit from Pastor Allen come up all the way up here, you know. And Pastor Allen's like, man, do you know, man, you got to stay away from those things. No, I have to address what it is. I have to inform the church. When you start to see some of this crazy stuff, it's biblical. It's in the Bible. Um, what about, you know, the pursuit of holiness? Start preaching against sin in the church that, you know, homosexuality and adultery and fornication and drinking and drugging, that you ain't going to heaven if you live that lifestyle. Right. Oh, man. Just like Jesus said, they're going to walk out the door. They're going to leave. They're not going to do it. I'm not talking about resurrection life. I'm talking about the church body as a whole. They stay away from things that will commit career suicide. Why? Because they won't be able to pay their rent. They won't be able to pay their staff. They won't be able to... And that's what the church has become. It's become, you know, exactly what Christ had to deal with in His day. The house of God, He came in. As soon as He came riding in, it had became a den of thieves. Robbers and thieves. And guess what He did? He ran them out. And we're going to get into a little bit about that. Um, another one... Uh, um, the pursuit of holiness, uh, preaching against sin, you know, uh, trampling God's grace. Um, say, you know, say it, it to someone, you know, hey, they ain't not once saved, always saved. True, I'll get you out the door. Whoa. Right? You ain't going to be accepted nowhere. Especially any Baptist church you go to. They're going to, you know, what? If you don't believe like them, then you have to go. Yeah. But when we get down to it, we need to follow what the Bible says. You know, you know what research means? To, to research what others have already searched out. To find out, man, are we really the body of Christ? Are we really trying to walk and do what it is that God has called us to do as a body? You and I need to be equipped and ready to give an answer to people that, you know, you need to be able to go in your word and show them, hey, man, look what the Bible says. And if they don't want to receive it, well, then you can't just plant the seed there. The ground's too hard, right? Um, 
I tell you what, reading and studying the Bible is going against the norm. You know, actually just try to explain to them that you have to read the Bible in context, that you can't pull a scripture out, give them the context of it. They're like, man, that ain't, that ain't what I believe. I don't see it like that. You know, and it's because you haven't read it and studied it. You know, so, man, you guys, you know, uh, you know, there's stands that we're going to have to make and stuff like that. But anyway, check this out. I told you God, this is where the Word really comes in. God always confirms His Word. Always. The message today is the high cost for truth. That's what it's about. Because there's either two ways you can go. I was up on a stage and up on the altar this morning and my brother had a dream. And my mom walked up and he said, Man, I had a crazy dream this, uh, last night. Had a bad day yesterday. He had a bad day yesterday. And, and come, over, come over here real quick and uh, tell your dream real fast. I had a horrible day yesterday. Come right here. From the time I woke up. From the time I went to sleep. And then also having a dream. The dream was me and my brother was in a truck. We were going somewhere. Um, and when we got there... It was a big open field, nobody was there, but there was two walls, probably about shoulder width, and there was a door, and, uh, sorry, when we opened the door, uh, uh, we opened the door, and we, when we walked in, we stepped into it, both sides of the walls was on flame, was in flames, you know, it was the top, so it was a chamber that we were in, and the floor, the top, both walls was on fire, well, all of a sudden, um, when uh, we looked down, everything around us was cool. So it'd be like a a clear blue ice barrier that was surrounding us. Um, and then we hear a lot of screaming through it. And then you'd see demonic spirit, you know, manifest all around us from the top, underneath, but nothing would penetrate um, penetrate us. So um, him and I both at the same time screamed out the name Jesus or Yeshua and. We stepped out. When we got out of the room, the, the field was loaded with people. And um, while we were just sitting there, standing around, standing and talking, my brother and I, we went back to the door, opened up the door again, and stepped into it again. And everything uh, became what it was. Everything was on fire on both sides, the ceiling and the floor. But everything around us was cool. And then I woke up. So that was that was his dream. He's walking in this door that's about shoulder length, and it's we're protected inside the door. It's a field which represents people, right? And you know you're walking in through a door. Um, so, and he said it was shoulder length. This is the my first scripture I got wrote down is two ways of life. This is the. Uh, where the message starts. So I want you to turn your Bible. Go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew 7, 13. I'm going to start reading there. You guys are familiar with it. Two ways of life. I'm also going to commit probably another, you know, career suicide. You know, you know me, I'm a King James Version. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read out this, this, this ESV, easy reading, I just picked up, right? Ooh, King James, you're not King James only. Oh. Right? It's so crazy out there, you know what I mean? So, I'm going to read it to you from, uh, from here. It's the same, it doesn't, uh, in fact, I'm going uh, to read Matthew 7 from, from the King James. Um, in Matthew chapter 7 I want you to realize that in Matthew chapter 7 it really starts in chapter 5 this is what the Lord was teaching on from the Sermon on the Mount so all of that he talked about in the Sermon on the Mount he's continuing they all sitting in the Mount and, and this is you know coming to the end of it but this is what he says there are two ways of life and he says uh, enter ye in at the straight gate now, it's pretty amazing that Jason comes up here, tells us about a dream, right? About going in through a door, a gate, and it's shoulder-width-width-wide. God, narrow. 
right? And inside this gate, you're protected. But everything else around you is on fire, right? So listen what, um, listen what Jesus is saying. I'm going to get you into the context of what's going on. He says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, meaning it's the word narrow. For narrow is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Right? It's not an easy path. It's the path, it's the path less traveled. It's rocky, bumpy, hilly, up and down. You know, it's not the big wide path that's easy. You just walk down and there ain't nothing there to trip you up or anything like that. Listen what he does and what he's talking about because this is what the whole message is going to be gathered around today. Beware of false prophets, false teachers. This is what is talked about throughout the whole New Covenant, the New Testament. The false teachers. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. You know? But inwardly, they are raving wolves. They are hungry wolves. You shall know them by their actions, by their fruits. That's how you're going to know who they are. (coughs) Do men gather grapes of thorns? Thorns was part of the curse. Or figs of thistles, that's all part of the curse, right? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. He's talking about false prophets, false teachers, and sheep's clothing. Those that are preaching from the from the pulpit, sitting in the church with you. I mean, you wouldn't think, but you're going to see what happens as I go on. Not everyone, Jesus said that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Man, there are so many. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That means you have to do what it is that God has called you to do. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That word is preach. And in thy name we have cast out devils. In thy name we have done many uh, wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Remember, what is this about? False teachers, false prophets. That's what he's talking about here. They profess Jesus, they ravenous wolves, they praying off you, feeding off you, whatever it is, living off of you. But they won't give it to you straight. Why? Because it will affect them. They don't produce good fruit. In fact, it don't take, you know, uh, long to find out, you know, the path that they're going down and the path that they're on. All you have to do is look at their lifestyle. What are they about, right? Therefore, he says, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. Now, this is a warning that Jesus is putting out to the sheep. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, that requires something of you and me, I will liken in him to a wise man which builds his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came. What does that mean? Trying times are going to come. Right? They're going to come for you and me. And the winds blew and beat upon that house. The house that we're building for the Lord. We're going to go through things. And it fell not. For it was founded upon the rock. That's where we need to be. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine. 
and doeth them not, shall, the ho- uh, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Man, this is like totally, they're hearing something they've really never heard before, how the teachings are coming forth through Christ, right? So, Matthew chapter 7, enter in at the straight gate. I started, me personally, I started down this path about 17 years ago. When I started reading the Word for myself and getting into it, and God started revealing things to me, which caused me to have to make a stand. Either this is what the Bible says, and this is what's being said in this context, or it's not. And let me tell you something. Rejection followed. Rejection followed. And many of you who is, and that's the reason you're here, you guys, you know, because you don't fit in with the norm. We don't fit in with the norm. We don't do church as norm. You know, we don't fellowship as norm. We allow, you know, everyone to talk and express themselves and what they believe. Do we all agree on the same thing? No, we don't on everything. We don't agree. We stay focused on Jesus Christ and what He's done. But we can talk about other things without, you know, those that, uh, that can't handle it, they leave. Oh, I can't be a part of that. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ was laying down truth and busting them wide open. Yeah. Even He said, are you going to leave me now? And those that followed Christ, oh yeah, well, He only had 12, right? But it says He had 70 other that He sent out. But the crowds followed him for what? Oh, the only reason you came is because I fed you on the other side. Because of what Jesus had healed them and gave them food. And that's the way it is nowadays. And this is what Jesus warns us about in the end. When you can't do, you know, when you can, when the church doesn't perform and do for the people, well, they just leave and go someplace else. Right? So I started down this path. About 17 years ago. And let me tell you something. Uh, I have not come off of it in 17 years. Amen. And I'm not gonna. Amen. And let me tell you something. It's a path left fo- least followed. Amen. It's hard. It's a hard path to walk. Because when God tells you to talk about something or do something that's against the norm. Man, it got to a point where I just smiled and said, You know what, Lord? If I do this, I'm just going to wa- uh, watch more just walk out the door and he told me they're not walking out on you they're walking out on me and as long as we stay rooted and founded in Jesus Christ and his word and what it says and it lines up with his word in the context of which it's spoken because really when it gets down to it really what it all matters uh, you know the end result is about you and me loving one another do I love you do you love me that's what it's about everything else is built on that love Love bears all, right? That's right. And it lists out all that love does. It's not boastful. It's not envy. You know, it's not envious. And it just goes on and on in Galatians about what the fruits of the Spirit is and what, you know, God has called us. Look, man, it's okay if we don't agree on something, but God has called us to love one another. It's not, hey, well, if you don't believe the way I believe, I'm going someplace else. Man, can we believe that, believe on that Jesus is the only way? Can we believe that that when Jesus says only those that do the will of the Father is going to be saved? Well, a lot of people don't. They believe they can do other things, right? And the judgment they pass on you is, uh, you know, you might as well get used to it now because it's going to get harder as we go. Things are not going to get easier for you and me because there's a stand that you're going to have to make. I started down this path a long time ago. In verse 15, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are hungry wolves. Wolves that feed on and off of people. They only got you in their church or their, you know, their building for one reason. 
It's, you know, what you can do for them. They have churches where if you don't submit your, you, you know, your, uh, your tax form, you can't be a part of that church. They want to see what your income is. They record it every week, and if you're not paying your tithes every week, they come and address you. Hey, you can't be a part of this affiliation if you're not tithing like you're supposed to. Yeah. And then they, it's okay in the churches that, you know, well, we ain't going to preach against, you know, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, because we don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers. We just want to love them. That's not love. Yeah. If there's no correction, reproof, instruction, direction, if that is not in the church, if, that's not, if there is not a balance of law and grace, you know, the absence of law is anarchy. Right. Right? And if there's too much grace, it's grease, it's Nicolation, which Jesus said himself, I hate it. You can't have, it's just like having just a mother in a house and not a father. The father is the law. The mother is the grace. We come together as one, we stand as one. Right? That's why you can't have grace without the law and law without the grace. Because the law is our school teacher. Right? It's our schoolmaster, our tutor. And Paul said in Galatians, once you've been learned by it, you have no need of it anymore. You know what that means? It's already in you. It's established in you. There's a consequence for whatever it is that we do. There's consequences. But you know what? They say, oh, we're not under the law no more. We're under grace. Well, let me ask you, how many of you went to school? Because the school teacher is the old covenant. That's the tutor. You need to know and have gone to school so that you can see it's really all about what Christ has done. And once you figure that out and you know it, man, you don't have need uh, where, you know, the law to keep you in order. I remember when I went to prison and I was preaching in prison, I told the guys, I'm glad you're here. It's good you're here in prison. And they looked at me like I was nuts. I said, the reason that you're here is because you can't control your flesh. So God has orchestrated the prisons and jails to control you because you can't control your flesh. You think you can go out in the world, do drugs and drink, and there's no consequences, and you ride down the road and you kill somebody. And you're wondering why you're sitting in prison. It's because the law was given. The law is for the flesh. But once you got your flesh under control, you you ain't got to worry about the police that's out there. That's right. Right? Oh, leave me alone. I want to do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Man, God instituted the law to control the flesh. Can you just think there was no law? Would anybody be safe? No, people would do whatever they wanted to do. They wouldn't work. They would rob, kill, pillage. Where there's no law, there's anarchy. There's got to be a balance between law and grace. The law is our schoolmaster. It never was supposed to bring us to... It never was supposed to save us. It was only to show us that in our flesh we're sinful. And we need a Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what it's there for. And that's why the Bible says it's good, it's precious, and it's holy. Take a man out of the house that's not on the authority of God, where a woman is just in a house, and watch what the kids do. Watch what they do. They go crazy. They run all over the mom. Because the mom was never there to be an institution of the law. It was the dad. I told you guys about, um, you know, this was a while back, a good while back. In in Africa, they had uh, elephants begin to kill people all over the place. They started killing people. So this lady goes out there. They called the specialist on elephants to go over there to find out, man, what is going on? You know, these elephants, two-year-old elephants, man, they are coming into villages. They're killing the people. They're killing rhinos. I mean, they're just going crazy. So this lady got there, and she couldn't figure it out. But while she was there for a little while, she was sitting down there watching them and, and all of that, and she said, man, where 
you know, she saw the, the full-grown, mature female elephants, but there was no bull elephants. So the lady had asked them, where is all the bull elephants in the herd? And they said, well, the elephant's population had grown so much, we had to cut back on the elephant population, so they went in helicopters and started killing off all the bulls in the herd. So when all the young elephants came up, they came into musk at two years old, there was none there to keep the, the, the young, uh, immature elephants that was coming up. As soon as they went two years old, went in musk, they went crazy. The moms couldn't keep them. In order, it took the bull elephants. And the lady, the, the woman said, who was a specialist, she said, I want to do something. I want you to get a bull elephant and I want you to put them in this herd. They had no more problems, no more killing, everything ceased. Because the male authority, you know what that male authority is? The law. It's God. And when there's no God and there's all grace, woman, if you want to call it the, because Christ multiplied, and some people might take that. It was through Christ that we're all born. The feminine side, the grace side. I'm not calling Jesus Christ a woman. But if there's all grace and no law, there's anarchy. What does that mean? That means the young teenagers run around and do what they want. They hang out on the streets till late at night. They get, you know, they do things they're not supposed to do because like my dad said, when I was coming up, he was the law. When them street lights come on, boy, you're behind. Better be in this house. And listen, he put the fear of God in me or the fear of dad. You understand? I knew what it was to feel his hand. He was dad. And mom was love, <laughs> with grace. But you know what? They complimented and, and, you know, for the most part, worked together one with another. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's why it's crazy now. It's the same thing in a church. If I just encourage you and preach grace to you and tell you Jesus loves you and it's going to be okay and eventually you're going to be delivered from that sin and look, you know, I know you're homosexual now or I know you live in adultery right now or I know you're fornicating but one day God's going to deliver you from it and everything's going to be okay. No. No, Jesus said, repent. Right. Right. And stop it! Right. Why? Because there's consequences for what you're doing. That's right. There is a consequence for it. Everybody doesn't feel the consequences. Thank you, Jesus. Everything that I sowed, I didn't reap. I did sow some things. But man, there's got to be a balance. Listen, and we understand the Word of God, the grace of God, through the tutor. And this is what Paul and Jesus is warning about. All throughout the New Testament, you're going to see what the New Testament is is all about as I go on. Man, warning the sheep about false teachers. Because they're going to bring in what? Damnable heresies. Wow. You're going to find out that everyone that's in there, all these epistles, is Paul is writing and Peter is writing, is confronting. Nowadays, the church won't even confront a damnable heresy. Hey, let's talk about... You know, whatever it is, once saved, always saved, or the pre-tribulational rapture, or do you have to speak in tongues to be saved, or is there really a hell or not, or is there really giants, whatever. The, the, The stuff that churches, you know, tiptoe easy on because they won't, they don't want to offend. The Bible says Jesus come to bring a sword to divide. That's right. Husband against wife. Father against the son. Daughter against the mother. 
Because that's what His Word does. Yeah. His Word brings division. Division. Two ways. The narrow path or the wide. The dream that Jason had was through the narrow door. Remember I told you when I did a study on narrow is the path. That word narrow breaks down and goes into the width of the shoulders. Wow. Everything else on the other side of those walls is on fire. He stepped out. He was in a field. The field represents the harvest, represents the people. People don't realize, but that field, what God was showing him, that field was on fire and they were burning. And when you open up the narrow gate and walk through the door, now you can see. You don't have blind eyes. You can see what's really out there. It's fire and agony. True love is to do what it is that God has called you to do. Make a stand for what's right so that others can see and follow. Me comforting them in their sin doesn't help them. They're still on fire. They're still burning. Making a, a stand for what's true. Man, it's a high cost. Because you're going to be rejected. You're not going to be accepted. That's right. Your life, you must bear good fruit. Salt water and fresh water can't come out of the same spring. You realize that. When Jesus gave the example of a man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back, it's not worthy. It was a wooden plow. You start plowing the field, you're working for the Lord to sow seed. When you look back, you'll break your plow. Why? Because you're not paying attention to the rock that's in front of you. You break that plow. That means you can't sow no more. What does that mean? That's a Christian who's plowing the field, who goes back into the world. His plow is broke. You can't live one way in church. Be double-tongued, two-faced. Go on a job site or when you're around people, if they cussing, you cussing. If they telling dirty joke, you telling dirty. Tell somebody you don't want to hear a dirty joke when they want to tell you. I don't want to hear that. What? Come on, man. People won't even make a stand for that. Because, oh, they don't want to feel, you know, stupid. Or they don't want to be rejected. There's a high cost for the truth. And it requires you to die to yourself. How hard do you think it was for Jesus Christ to come and preach the doctrine that He was preaching right there in front of those people? And, and, and telling the, 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 the Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, calling the blind, leading the blind. And Him saying, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. The sin... They dress up a certain way. They look a certain way. They throw money so everybody could see it. They do long prayers. Man, it's the same thing that's happening today. Same thing that's happening today. He says, uh, so after reading Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 29, who are we going to follow, man or God? Man is the one that changed the Sabbath from from Saturday to a Sunday. You tell a Christian that. And they know it. Saturday is the real Sabbath. Why? Because Constantine in 337 or whatever it is, so that they could bring in paganism into the church, they changed it from, you know, Saturday... They went to Sunday to worship the sun god. You tell the churches today, you know, you're actually worshiping on the sun god day that Rome changed. Oh, you know, that's just how it is. You have church on Saturday, something's wrong with you. But, I mean, just make, making a stand for that. People, man, they ain't gonna like you. Just tell them the research. I mean, where in the Bible, where in the Bible does it say that we're to honor Christ's birthday? Tell me! 
Was it ever about his birthday? No. It was about his death and what he's done. Man, the holidays, the traditions that the Christians follow from May Day. You ever looked at that to find out hey, what's Valentine's Day all really all about? What is Christmas about? What is Mardi Gras about? What is, you know, uh, what, what is Ash Wednesday really about? What is really the 40 days of Lent? But it's okay for Christians. At Mardi Gras, which is coming, you're going to see, go on YouTube, go to your friend's thing, you're going to see your friends that go to church on Sunday in New Orleans, out there with their hands raised up. Oh, we're not out there, you know, to worship God. This is a family thing. It's paganism. Yeah. But you're afraid, most of them are afraid to make a stand for righteousness. Why? Because they'll be rejected. Their families won't accept them. Yeah. Tell your family you're not going to open a present this, Chris, you know, this Christmas. What is the Yule log? What is the Yule log? What is the Christmas tree? What are the tw- real 12 days of Christmas? I'm not here to... I'm just... Man, Jesus Christ would never touch any of these pagan holidays. But yet, the pastors in the pulpits don't speak against it. And let their sheep go take part in it. You know, if you was in Sodom, when fire and brimstone rained down, just like if you was in New Orleans, at the Mardi Gras, and they set off a nuclear weapon and you died, I would not want to be in your shoes when you stand before God. You understand that? Everybody thinks Jesus Christ is grace, grace, grace. Grace is that He died and made a way for you and me to come to Him to live a holy life. Those who do the will of the Father will be saved. Not, I asked Him into my heart, I'm eternally saved, I can do what I want. You preach that message... You ain't going to have much money in an offering. (laughs) Look up the word money. The definition of money. What? Yep, filthy lucre. It was named after a god, Monet. That's why on a dollar bill and on our bill it says, In God we trust. What God? It's not Yod Hey Vav Hey. It's not Yeshua Hamashiach. It's the God of money that they got printed on there. Their money. Our riches is in heaven. Colossians 2. Let's see. Colossians 2, verse 1 through 8. That's why. Thank you, Lord. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. I'm sorry to say Paul had to work. He didn't force no tithe on any of the bodies, or any of the churches. And if anybody could receive a tithe, definitely it'd be him. I know it's kind of crazy. I got to... Instead of using the King James, I picked up this for the first time, this ESV. Oh my God. Oh my God, ESV. Huh? Yeah, I picked it up in the back. I just read it and I just, it's saying the same thing basically. If you're going to study, you're going to study out the King James. This is all I use. I just read it and I just liked the way it was, it was said. Believe me, I, I checked it. Listen, cause, listen to this. Paul's ministry to the church. In verse chapter 2 he says, um, Paul says, For I want you to know how great of a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery 
which is Christ. So the whole covenant, everything that was hid, it's all about Jesus Christ. That's what he said. That's what Paul said. I studied it. I know it. I learned it. Wow. It's all about him. Right? In whom, now watch this, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no, that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. I don't want you to be deluded. How much is being deluded from the pulpit? They delude it because they don't want to cause offense to watch their money walk out the door. They're more worried about their money than the people that are sitting in the congregation. They don't care that the people in the congregation, they say they love them, but they don't give them both sides. Why is the Word of God quick and powerful and sharper than any any two-edged sword? Old covenant, one side. New covenant, the other side. It's not one-sided. Therefore, he says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Man, they were being brought away through damnable heresies that was coming in. You know, look, all you have to do is believe and have faith in what Jesus Christ has done. Oh, no, no, no. You, got, you, you can believe that. That's okay. But you got to do this as well. Man, it's false teachers. What I said through eight. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. It's your responsibility that the pastors and preachers and evangelists and so-called apostles don't deceive you. It's up to you. And if you're deceived by them, it's not their fault. It's yours. And now, we've come to a time that Jesus Christ said, when you give them the truth, they don't want it. They don't want to hear it. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit, according to human tradition. Wow. Let me ask you something. Can you worship Jesus Christ the way you want or you, we have to worship Him the way God has said? Because, you know, I'll step on your sacred cows. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'll step on them. Wow. It's crazy. Churches even do Halloween and put on big shows. They're even right now into, they don't call it destiny card reading. They call it, I mean, they don't call it tarot card reading. Bethel Church... Bethel Church now is part of where they're doing destiny card readings. They put cards out, put stones on top. Whatever you feel, pick a card. They say they're not fortune telling, they're destiny telling. Look it up for yourself. And anything, you see, they'll accept, oh, we're doing it so we can reach those that are out there that is into all of that. It's a new age. Here, let me read to you what they said. Check this out. Mind blowing. This is what. I'm talking about um, they're into oh, let me just read this um, um, let's see Jen Hodge in Destiny Cards 
Um, she says they're not tarot cards. They speak against sorcery. Um, she calls the readings that she does encounters. They don't look like tarot cards. Uh, mean, uh, let's see. Um, let's, let me see. My wife wrote this down. Um, Actually, I got it. That's what I'm, I'm looking for right now. Here, um, I think this is it. Um, here's what it says about them. Christ Alignment website that's connected to it. Um, it says, um, Chris Volton of Bethany Bethel Church. They're not tarot cards. These are great people who are leading people to Christ. And, uh, and, and we're being destroyed by fake news. The Hodges are not part of Bethel. Uh, their son is a part of Bethel. However, uh, Chris responds to the Hodges letter. So, you know, uh, they are part of the Bethel church. And this is what they say on their website. This is about us. The Christ Alon team is based in Melbourne, uh, Australia, or trained spiritual consultants. Watch this. Gifted in various modalities, which means methods or procedures in communicating with the Spirit. Right? We practice a form of of supernatural healing that flows from the universal presence of Christ. This is a mega church. Watch this. We draw, this is that statement. We draw from the same divine energy of the Christ Spirit. Jesus warns about false Christs. We draw from the same divine energy of the Christ Spirit. As as I can't even read a word. As followers um we operate only out of the third heaven realm to gain insight and revelation. That's what's now happening in some of the biggest forms, which is all connected with um, Todd White. Uh, Christ Christ alignment. We are never to be intimidated. A root word for intimidation is divination. This is about drag queens and the queer expo in 2017 where they're going to do this stuff. Man, let me tell you something. This is what Christ... They go around now... um, they also doing in Jesus culture, which is Bethel Church, right? They do soul sucking. They go lay on former graves of dead preachers, ministers, Smith Wigglesworth, to suck the spirit or the soul out of them so they could receive it. Watch this. They also are doing now what is called knighting in the church. They're knighting people. Um, What is knighthood? It's lower nobility. They call it Christian war. They now become a Christian, a Christian warrior. It is an honorary title given by a monarch or a political power. So now, 
in these churches, they come up there with a sword and knight you. I mean, listen, but you know what? Let me ask you a question. How come in the body of Christ, there are people that are not standing up and saying, man, what is that? Amen. You know what? Some of them are. And then the elders that are at that church and the people out of there kind of grab them by the arms and say, hey, leave and don't ever come back. You have to make a stand. And I'm going to show you why. Kind of crazy stuff, huh? In Colossians, what we just read in verse 8, I like, you know, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, after the, the principles of this world and not after Christ, it has a form of godliness. Oh, it, man, that, that looks okay. But the church, that is, the people, the sheep that are sitting in the pew, because they don't know their word, they can't, you know, man... They put in all their trust in the pastor, in the preacher, in this pulpit. That's the deepest pit to be in. They're in it. They're up there lying, telling the people what it is they want to hear. Just like Jesus said. Um, go to... Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 1 through 15. I'm going to read this to you. Got a couple of more scriptures. Mark chapter 7. I'm telling you people, you know, as long as, you know, we preach the truth and tell people the truth, it's only going to be a remnant. Yeah. It's only going to be a remnant, and it's hard. We have been called to study to show ourselves approved. To show yourself approved. So you're not, you know, led away. Mark chapter 7. He says, verse 1 through 15. Watch this. See what we're talking about. Uh, Mark 7. Now, this is the tradition that Jesus is now confronting the Pharisees and Sadducees. Watch this. Because when it all comes down to it, what Jesus is talking about, what the apostles and and prophets and everything is talking about it's all about they want money they want your money they've made merchandise of you you know so they can heap upon themselves if you find a pastor you know doing things with the money that he's not supposed to be doing well I need a jet 60 million we need a, uh, a multi-million dollar building Man, let me tell you, he's, he's dressing in Armani suits. Things is not right. Now when the Pharisees had gathered together with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of the disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding in the tradition of the elders. I'm not following in the tradition of the churches and the elders. I'm not. I'm a follower what the Bible says. That's it. And, you know, you're not going to be liked too much. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash their hands. And there are many other traditions that they observe. This is Jesus saying, right? Such as washing the cups and pots and copper vessels and uh, uh, dining and couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Why are you not having church on Sunday? Why you just don't preach love? Why you preach against the tithe? <laughs> But they, why do you, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said unto them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. He called him a hypocrite. Have you ever saw a pastor from a pulpit call someone a hypocrite? Oh, they would stone him. 
You hypocrite, get out! <laughs> wow! You hypocrites! It is well what Isaiah did prophesy of you, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Who said have church on Sunday? Who said? Who said you can't have church on Saturday or Monday? Or, or, or Thursday or Tuesday? Because you don't fit in. You leave, watch this. You leave the commandment of God. He's going to hit them in their heart. Watch how he hits them in their heart. He says, you leave the commandment of God to hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles his father and his mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me, it is Corban. That means it's to be given to God. So whoever tells his father, his mother and his dad when they're old, I can't use my money to take care of you. It's Corban. It goes to God. That's what it says. Look what Jesus said. Then, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and his mother. Thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. Your mama, take care, your mama and your daddy took care of you and me when we were babies. The Bible says when your mom and daddy's old and like babies, you take care of them. Right. Whatever money you got to take care of them. Don't tell mom and daddy, I can't take care of you. I got to give this to the new church building. Baloney! So what was that tradition... You know, what was the tradition made for? So that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the hypocrites could get the people's money. To rob them. To make merchandise of them. 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at this. Look what Peter says. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm just about done, guys. 2 Peter 2. Hey, many people will watch this message. They'll turn it off quick. 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, like them ones that go on that go on a TV. Money, 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 money. Bring money now. Name it, claim it. Bring money. Everybody in the congregation, bring money now. And then preachers say, bring your money to him. And God's going to fill your pocketbooks up when the whole time their pocketbooks are filled. Won't you send them an empty checkbook, let them fill your checkbook, and send a checkbook back to you. Yeah. What? Uh, they'll, hang up the, they'll hang up the phone on you. you like it, Remember, the whole deal about this is focused around the false teachers, the false prophets taking from you, feeding off of you. What can you do for the phony shepherd? Shepherds that are out there. What do you have to offer? What can you give? What can you do? 
And watch. The rich ones will be sitting in the front because the pastor will, you know, he'll be riding their sports cars and in their boats and, you know, any little thing. They got in churches today now, you give a tithe, you give an offering, and you write a check out to the pastor. Label it on the side. This is from my pastor. Put your name on it. Then these will be given to the pastor that no one sees. So now he's got favorites. Uh Uh-oh. Where is this stuff coming from that the congregation sits there and accepts it? You know why? Because they're dumb sheep going to the slaughter. Because all they want to do is make merchandise out of you. Don't send the hypocrites your money. Take your money, and if you see a need, meet a need. Because you're the church, you're the body, you're the temple, you're the priest. And you're the one that's supposed to be dealing with your offerings. Give it where you see fit. Man. Look at 2 Peter chapter... Same, same thing. Oh, I mean, 2 Timothy. Look what Timothy says. This is Paul talking to Timothy. And two more. What he says to Timothy. In Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. What he says, 1 through 4, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. Hey, this is what, check this out. So Paul is telling Timothy to reprove people in church. What does that mean? It means, yeah, I wrote it in my other Bible, watch this. Man, this is, and this stuff doesn't happen in church. He says, be ready to do this. He says to him, reprove, he says, uh, reprove means to reprimand and censor someone that's saying something they're not supposed to be saying or ministering on something that's unbiblical or unscriptural. Yeah. Or you'd be let out the church. Don't worry about it because it's not the church of Christ. It's the church of Antichrist. Because the church was not set up and established that we can't be submitted one to another. Yeah. You ought to be able to question me If I'm standing here, you ought to be able to raise your hand in church. And if it sounds like false teaching, hey, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Where is that word? Can I ask you a question? They'll never do it. And if they can't answer it, oh, well, I'll talk to you later. And then your later will be, you don't belong here. You need to go find another church. 20 years later. Look, going to a church in a big building somewhere doesn't make you saved. It's your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Bible says where two or more are gathered, he's in the midst. Right. You could have church at your house. Thank you. He says, be ready. He says, preach the word. I charge you in the presence of God, Paul said, Christ Jesus, who is the judge of living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove them and rebuke them with all long suffering. Exhort. Um, Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Yeah. Right? But having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you... Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. That's what uh, Paul tells him. Watch this. Next one. 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, uh, 
But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. Brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He's telling this to the church. Yeah, come on. Last scripture, Second Timothy chapter one. I mean chapter Second Timothy chapter two. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Of many witnesses and trust this of what I'm telling you to faithful men who will be able to teach others also share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who has enlisted him man the message today you have to know your word right there's a high cost for it too. There is a high cost for truth. And just like it's career suicide for me, it's a career suicide for you too. Because your own family is going to reject you even when you try to talk to them about the simplest things in the Bible. Why? Because the majority of them don't know their word. They don't read. They don't spend time with the Lord. And the whole time they're going to church Deceived by the false teachers and doctrines. And they all believe that they're going to make it. But it's up to you, not me. It's up to you not to be deceived. It's up to you to spend time with the Lord. To look for yourself to find out, man, is what he's saying, is it true or not? That's why it's called research. Research what has been taught to you. If you're going to a Pentecostal church, find out if you have to speak in tongues to be saved. Go sit down with the Lord and read and study and see. If you're being taught once saved, always saved, you need to be able to answer to God for yourself. Man, research. Don't take the pastor's word for it. Don't believe me. You need to go look for it for yourself. I'm confident that when I stand before for the Lord, I'm ready to give an answer for what I've done and what I walked. Are you? Most are going to say, huh, I'm, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Catholic. When you ask someone today, you know, they don't want to know if you're saved. They want to know uh, what church you go to. What has that got to do with anything? What does that have to do with anything? Man, let's pray. Father, I delivered the message, Lord, yes. about deception, Lord, and the high cost. Lord, I pray, Father, that as time grows harder, Father, that you would, uh, Lord, just continue to build us up, Father, to strengthen us. Lord, to make a stand for, for righteousness, Father. For righteousness and holiness in the last days so that others can see it. Lord, make us a church that's uncompromised, Lord. That's not willing to, uh, to compromise your word for anything, Father. Strengthen us, Lord. Encourage us, Father. Add to your church, Lord. And Father, give us direction on what it is that we're supposed to do. Because, Lord, unless you pay the bills, then we won't be here, Father. But if this is where you want us to be, Father, make provision. And if not, well then, Father, I guess next week we'll have church at my house. I thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Yes, sir. Yeah. I